I'd like to welcome all of you here. Thank you for being here. I'm Gloria Palmer, the Executive Director of Green Mountain Academy for Lifelong Learning. Just a little bit of um, announcements before we begin. Um, I'd like to tell you our next lecture is on Tuesday, August 23rd. There was not one next week. And that is with Peter Radford, who is a local economist and the president of the GMAL board. His talk is titled, The Machinery Question. The entire industrial era has been characterized by the emergence of various technologies that have shaped our lives, our society, our politics, and our economy. From the steam engine to artificial intelligence, this talk will take stock of our relationship with technology. Yes. And that will be held here at the Manchester could, Library at start, if the five, could we dim the light? I'd like to thank the Manchester Community Library for hosting us today. Um, yeah, yeah. I'd also like to thank GNAT TV for videotaping this presentation the contrast as they make do so many of our other slides. programs. Thank you very much. Many thanks to Anthony and Anne McLaurin for introducing tonight's presenter to GMOL. During Q&A, we have two microphones that will be available, and so I ask that you raise your hands when you have a question, and just wait for either myself or Liz to bring the mic to you. And I'd also like you to silence your cell phones. Our guest is an American architectural historian and recognized authority on the British country house. He has written, lectured, and taught in the US and abroad on British history, and leads scholarly tours that focus on the architectural and artistic heritage of Britain and its influence around the world. Since 1999, he has maintained an award-winning database on the web, thedcamillo.com, which seeks to document every English, Scottish, Welsh, and Irish country house ever built, standing or demolished, together with a history of the families who lived in the houses, the architects who designed them, and the history of the houses, collections, and gardens. In recognition of his work, he has been presented to the late Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, and the Prince of Wales. He is an alumnus of both the Royal Collection Studies Program and the Addingham Summer School for the Study of Historic Houses and Collections. In addition, he is a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts, is a fellow of the Massachusetts Historical Society, and a member of the Council of the American Museum in Britain. During the day, he is the curator of special collections at the New England Historic Genealogical Society in Boston, the world's oldest and largest genealogical society. We are so honored to have with us Kurt DiCamillo. Please join me in welcoming him to the podium. For heaven's sake. That's very kind, thank you. Can everybody hear me at the back? I know this is sort of tinny sounding. Can everyone hear all around the room here? Um, I got a little, yeah, this way, yeah. I, I, can't, I can't face that way, doesn't like it. Um, so I'm gonna be standing here, <laughs> right underneath this screen. Um, first, what I wanna say is how important this country is. And to give you a sense of the scale, England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland together, the four component parts of the United Kingdom, are smaller, all four of them, than Oregon. So you think about what this teeny tiny little country has done as far as its influence around the world, and it is astonishing. And a lot of the residue of that is, oh, it's less tinny now, that's exciting. Um, a lot of the residue that comes in these houses, because the, the British uniquely in Europe put everything into the country houses. The art, there are more old master paintings even today in the country houses of Europe, I'm sorry, the country houses of Britain, than there are in all the museums of the world combined. And when you think about that, and that's after 100 years of sell-offs, because they've been selling off the art for 100, at least 120 years to pay taxes, mainly because of us, um, because in the late 19th century, we started importing grain so cheaply into Britain, the cheaper than they could afford to grow it. And we made agricultural depression just value of land just fell through the floor. And so things started falling apart then, and then there were the introduction of inheritance taxes, and all that came together to sort of try to squash this, most of which was been saved by the National Trust. 
what I want to first spotlight is what is not a country house. This is not a country house. So when I um, talk to Americans and I say I, I, I study British country houses, they're like, you mean a house in the country? It's not a house in the country. It's a house that is, is or was the center of an agricultural state with at least a thousand acres. In some cases, there were millions of acres attached to this. So this grand house in the middle was the economic and social center of this great state. And all the people on these estate, sometimes numbering in the thousands, would work for the lord or lady or the duke or whomever. And that is the opposite of what you see here because this isn't true either. Um, the houses aren't so big that you have to read in the newspaper that one of your wings burned down. Um, the reality is pretty grand, and you'll see that here in Stowe House. So this is an incredibly important house. Um, and th this actually is a one of those houses where you could probably burn a ring down and not know about it until the next morning in the paper. Um, but this is sort of a classic case of what happens when things go wrong. The, the last major owner of this, the Duke of Buckingham, had a visit from Queen Victoria, and he was so excited about this, as people always are, that he spent in today's dollars almost $100 million in furnishings and bankrupted himself. And therefore, the house was sold, not immediately after his death, but his heirs couldn't hold on. This is the rotunda in this great house you walk into. So this is basically the receiving room. And to give you a sense of the scale of this, this is a shot that I took a few years ago. Let's go back and get a real sense of what this room is like. This is a copy of the Pantheon in Rome. And it's just an astonishing work of art. But it all came crashing down in 1922 when his heirs, who had been hanging on by a thread financially, gave up the ghost. And this is a, an advertisement to sell the contents of the house. And this was going on all around Britain, these great houses, the contents are being sold. And it wasn't just the agricultural depression caused by the United States. It was also, in addition to death duties, it was also World War I, because World War I was the beginning of the end of everything. I, I believe World War I is possibly the most cataclysmic event in human history and the ripples of which we are still feeling today. And what happened here for these country houses is that the, the staffs, the enormous staffs, at Stowe they had over 100 indoor servants. So after the war, those who came back, a lot of them, most of them died sadly, um, didn't want to work in these houses because they paid ship wages, you got a half a day off a week, and you were basically an indentured servant. And the women who had actually moved into the factories to replace the men who went off to the war didn't want to go back to the houses because they were making much more money in factories. So the other thing you had is this huge lack of staff and no one could afford to keep them up. And let's not forget, when this was done, there wasn't any plumbing in this house. There was no electricity and there's no central heating and almost all these houses were like this. So what you had was just this total collapse of the, of the system. A lot of it was, I said, was caused by the war. This is a book I highly recommend. It's not in print anymore, but you can get it on Abe Books, abebooks.com, called The Country House at War. And it talks about World War I and II, but it mainly talks about World War II, because what World War I started, which was the decline of the country house and the decline of the aristocracy, World War II completely finished off. And it's important to remember that when um, Evelyn Waugh wrote Brides Had Revisited in 1945, he believed that this way of life was gone forever. He wrote this book particularly as somebody who had lived through this life and wanted to capture it for future generations because he thought no one would ever see this again. So that's what John Martin Robinson, the author of this book, talks about at great length. Every single house, without exception, was seized by the government. If you were smart, at Chatsworth, for instance, in Derbyshire, the great seat of the Dukes of, excuse me, <coughs> the Dukes of Devonshire, you saw what was coming, and rather than having your house taken by the government, you volunteered, volunteered, to give it to a school, because all the schools were being evacuated from the cities, and they wanted a place in the country for them. And that was good, because what that meant was you had, if you were really smart, you went to a girls' school, they treated the houses better. What you didn't want was the government coming in, because what the government did was turn it over to military uses. And what he spotlights in here is the condition of these houses, how they were treated by the troops. So you have an incredible variety. You have free French, you have American, Canadian, Australian, Polish. Um, every allied nation um, contributed troops, and they were all billeted for various purposes at these country houses. 
And they, of course, were young men, and they treated these houses horribly. There's one instance he talks about in here of these great Grindon Gibbings carvings on the wall of this house that the um, soldiers villager there just pulled off the wall and burned in the fireplace to stay warm. And when the owner, who was still living in a wing of the house, said, well, there's cords of wood outside the door, and they said, we're not walking outside to pick up the wood, and this is right here. So what's interesting, what John says in this book is, which of these nationalities do we think treated these houses the worst? No, the British. By far, the British were the worst because it was class resentment. So you have these working class blokes in the army, the Navy, all these forces, who resented the people who lived in these big houses. So they, they, were, they were just horrible. And a lot of these houses didn't make it out of the war because the government, after the war, limited maximum reimbursement to you as the owner of about 2,400 pounds, which even in 1946 wasn't that much money. And a lot of these owners, as I said, without central plumbing and electricity, said, forget it. I'm just going to tear it down, I'm going to take the money and go bye-bye. And that was all brought to life. The beginning of the modern preservation movement of country houses was here in 1974 at the v and Victoria and Albert Museum. This was an exhibition called The Destruction of the Country House. And all it was was um, a big gallery with photographs of every single country house that had been demolished in the last 50 years. And in the background, the speakers was just a tolling bell. Dum, dum. And it galvanized huge numbers of people's interest. And because people didn't realize this was being lost. So you have the beginning of what's called the listing movement. So today in Britain, if your house is listed, which is one of three important categories, it means the government protects it. So you can't alter it or demolish it without government permission. And, and appreciation of these houses, all of this came about because of this exhibition. And you started having people being proud. Now this is important because these are working class people who previously would have resented these houses and their occupants, proud of the fact that this was their heritage. And that's what saved these houses, is a sense of shared heritage, that this is ours, that this is uniquely British. Um, John Harris, who um, sadly just died, was one of the great historians of the country house, who said this, nowhere in the world are there so many country houses as in England, matchless for the astonishing variety of their styles and the richness of their collections and furniture. Um, it, it's, to me, it, it's still a goosebump moment. I've been going to these houses for 30 years and I still get goosebumps when I come up to the entrance of one of them. And the National Trust, who of course preserve about 400 of these houses, is to me one of the most amazing organizations in the world. Um, and this is a perfect example of what happened, what I was telling you about. So this is Bowood House in Wiltshire. The big house here, um, designed by Robert Adam, the great Scottish architect, was handed back to the owner, the Marcos of Lansdowne, after World War II, occupied by troops. And it was it had dry rot, it had wet rot. It was just a mess. And so the Diocletian wing you see here, which was added on in the late 18th century, where they had the stables and the offices, they decided to pull down the big house and keep the smaller wing because it was just easier to maintain. And this is actually a photograph of that wing, the Diocletian wing today. And this is where the family lives. But what I should have told you earlier is that this is not just a story about country houses, but something at each of these houses we're going to visit is particularly interesting, I hope, for everybody here that sort of resonates with um, something from history. And this is, to me, this is Robert Adams' library in the Diocletian Ring, which is, um, this house is open to the public, and this is one of those beautiful spaces. But we're actually here, here we go, for this very uninspiring room in the laboratory. And this is the reason we're here, because it was here that Joseph Priestley, who was the tutor to the, the um, children um, of the first Marcos of Lansdowne, in this very space discovered in 1774 something that he called deflogisticated air. I say discovered because it was all around us, because it's actually oxygen. Oxygen had never been identified until he discovered it here in this lab. And the first Marcos of Lansdowne was a very interesting character, unusually for the aristocracy, mm -hmm. he was interested in art, and particularly in science, and he wanted his children to be well educated. Um, this is him here. <laughs> this is um, the Treaty of Paris in 1783. It's important to remember that he, in 1783, was the Prime Minister of Great Britain. And this Treaty of Paris, and there were over 100 treaties of Paris, has the signatures there of John Adams and Benjamin Franklin. And it was this man who negotiated 
um, the end of the American War of Independence. And he was thus elevated from the Earl of Sherborne to the Marcos, and this was his townhouse. Um, and this is how it was in the 1930s. Lansdowne House, um, designed once again by Robert Adam. In the 1930s, they were widely in Barclay Square, where this is. And in order to accomplish that, they took all of this garden, sadly, and made it public space. And that still wasn't enough, so they took the facade here off, put it to one side, took 40 feet out of the inside, and put the facade back on. <laughs> so um, this is what it looks like today, sadly. Still there. It's the Lansdowne Club, which is a very nice club, a very big club. And you can see that this is the road right here, right up to the front, and this has been added onto to create more space for sleeping rooms. But what was interesting at the time, in the 1930s, is there was no big outcry among the intelligentsia about the loss of these really important Robert Adam designed rooms inside this house. The Americans were upset about this, and the Americans, God bless them, said, this is horrific, we have to save these rooms. And that's what happened. The drawing room came to the Philadelphia Museum of Art, which here it is today. This to me is one of the most important 18th century rooms in the United States. This is the original, these are the original colors that would have been at the time all designed by Robert Adam, this just cacophony of neoclassical splendor. And then you have, whoa, the dining room, which is at the Met. And this, at the time it would happen, all of these niches would have been filled with ancient Roman statues. This would have been one of the most important collections in the world in private hands of ancient um, Greek and Roman statues, all of which were sold off. So what the Met has here are all plaster copies of what the originals were because they had sold before the Met bought the room. And it's just very interesting because the Brits want these rooms back now. Um, <laughs> what, what's left, um, if you go into the Lansdowne Club, there's a bar, and what do they call it? The Treaty Room. So the bar, that's where the Marcus Lansdowne signed the treaty at the end of the American um, War of Independence. Now a bar, somewhat appropriately, I suppose. Um, if you go to Cambridgeshire, you go to Anglesey Abbey, and this is a house now owned by the National Trust. Unlike Downton Abbey, which has no medieval origins, usually, but not always, if it has the word abbey in it, it was originally a monastic building, and that was the case here. There was an abbey founded in 1135 by Henry I, and of course, our friend Henry VIII, who just did so much destruction in Britain, um, closed it as part of the dissolution of the monasteries in the 1530s, and as he did with all of these seized properties, he sold them off to raise money or gave them to his cronies as gifts. Um, and 17th century, it was acquired by this man right here, Thomas Hobbes, who was a Cambridge carrier. So a carrier is somebody you go to rent a horse for an hour, a day, a week. And traditionally, when you go into the stables, you would get to pick, you walk down and say, I like that, I want that horse. Hobbes here didn't like that. He told you which horse you're gonna take, regardless of which one you wanted. And it's from him that we have the expression Hobson's choice, which is to say, the choice that Hobson offers you or none at all. After his ownership, it passed into this family, Sir George, Sir George Downing. I, I, I love this because he graduated from Harvard in the class of 1642. Um, his father was sent over to Salem as, as a magistrate and he went to Harvard. He, um, <laughs> He was, he was, what they say in the UK, he was a bit of a lad. He definitely was, let's put it this way, he was a property developer, and that's never a good thing. Um, so he was in charge of this when he was in the United States after he graduated, and you can see it there, that's New Amsterdam. It is because of him, and expressed it because of his underhanded activities, that it became New York City. Because as you probably know, the Dutch handed over New Amsterdam really without a fight to the British. And it was because of the machinations of our man there. And I mentioned he was a property developer. Downing Street is named after him. He built Downing Street, the street and all the houses on both sides and on the back as speculative property. Um, and he, they, were, they were so poorly built that even to this day, they're in constant need of maintenance. They, they're all stinking. The, the quality of the brick is horrible. The quality of everything he did was just like a typical developer. I hope there are many developers in the audience today. Um, and it, but it's interesting. This is this is sort of his legacy. We forget almost everything about him except for the fact that he developed Downing Street. So back to Anglesey Abbey. His grandson, the third baronet, um, is the one who inherited this house. 
And it's interesting, he was a very rich man, and we have no indication of what he looked like. There are no surviving portraits. And recent scholars have suggested that he looked like this. Um, <laughs> what we know is that when he died, he left his money to found a college at Cambridge. And this is it, Downing College, once again, the Downing name perpetuated. Um, and this is the only college in Cambridge that's in the classical style. As you know, the Oxbridge colleges are very much noted for their Gothic styles. This is an incredibly beautifully designed, very austere Greek revival style designed by the same man who designed the National Gallery, William Wilkins. And you can see the National Gallery of London has the same, this is not considered a hugely successful building, I'm sorry to say. Um, it's, it has all kinds of issues, but same architect, um, very austere, no decoration. But what's cool about this is that it is the very first college in the world to be built on a campus. Now, those at UVA tell you that Thomas Jefferson was first, but he's not. Um, it was actually Cambridge that leaned out this whole thing. And what's interesting about this is this is the whole college right here. This bit in the middle, which is the, um, the chapel and some dorm rooms, that wasn't built until the 1950s. And as late as the 1980s, they're still building buildings. And this is really unusual. Every single building up until the 1990s is all in the classical style. So why am I showing you the badminton finals? I'm sure many of you can figure out why. And that's because badminton was invented where else but the badminton house in Gloucestershire. Um, this is a very grand house. It's never open to the public. It's owned by the Duke of Beaufort. And in 1863, in an attempt to have the ability for the inhabitants of the house, the wealthy inhabitants, to play sports, that and go outside in bad weather, but not knock things down. Um, they took the entrance hall here and invented this new game called badminton. And to this day, the regulation size of a badminton court is the same size as the entrance hall at Badminton House. Mm -hmm. And if you go here on the opposite wall from this one, there is the very first racket and the very first shuttle clock. And it was all an attempt to be able to exercise during bad weather without knocking things down and breaking them. I think that it's just so cool. <laughs> so, everybody, hopefully, in this room remembers this wonderful movie, The Remains of the Day from 1993. You see Anthony Hopkins here. That was filmed primarily inside Badminton Houses, the interiors of the fictional Darlington Hall. But the real reason we're here, besides the Badminton, which is wicked cool, it's very hard to see, and I apologize for this, that cabinet back there, that niche was built specifically that cabinet, this is considered by most furniture historians to be the most important piece of furniture ever made. And this is it. So let's talk about, I had that man there so you get a sense of the scale. So it's 12 and a half feet high, took 30 men five years to make it in the 1720s. It was made in the Grand Ducal workshops in Florence. So it's, what this is, is um, a pretadora, which is inlaid semi-precious stones to create a sense of three-dimensional options. Um, and it sold in 1990, the Duke of Beaufort sold it for eight million pounds. Sold it to a Johnson & Johnson heiress, I say heiress, she was, <laughs> she was the, the, the nurse to, let's say, an 85-year-old Johnson heir. She was in her 20s, she was very beautiful. He died and left her everything. It's shocking how these things happen. Um, so she bought it, and then she decided just about 14 years later, she wanted to sell it and everyone said, you'll never get your money back. It sold for just under $40 million. And it is still to this day, I believe, the most expensive piece of non-pictorial artwork ever sold at auction. And the question you might have is, who has $40 million for a cabinet? And the answer would be the Prince of Liechtenstein, because that's where it is today, the Liechtenstein Museum in Vienna. It's wicked cool. Um, so, I'm sure everybody knows about the Earl Sandwich, whether you know him or not, because he really did invent the sandwich. Um, there we go, Mr. Sandwich. So, he, depending on who you read, he was either really dedicated to work or really dedicated to gambling. And regardless, he didn't want to take the time to stop and eat a proper meal. So he discovered that eating meat without a knife and fork reduce your fingers got the paper greasy, either the paper of state papers or the playing cards. So how to solve that, he told his servants to put the meat between two pieces of bread. 
And that much is actually true. It really didn't start with him. Um, what's interesting for us as Americans is that during the American Revolutionary War, he was the second, our equivalent of the Secretary of the Navy, he was the first Lord of the Admiralty. And um, <laughs> I love this quote from the Encyclopedia Britannica. For corruption and incapacity, sandwiches administration is unique in the history of the British Navy. Most historians believe the, the best reason that Americans won as many naval battles as they did against the British is because the British, the Royal Navy was so poorly equipped and had been starved to cash for years that they just didn't have the capacity to deal with this. So he was not a good administrator, but also in the beginning of his administration of the Navy, you can see that here in the most serious strike of the century in 1775, there were big naval strikes. So take your minds back, what you see here is a ship being built for the Royal Navy by the Royal Navy. So unlike today where we have defense contractors, the Navy made their own ships. And these, um, these strikes are about one thing in particular, pieces of wood. So the reason the workers strike struck is because they got to take home leftover pieces of wood after each day's work. And that was considered one of the perks of the job. You have a Royal Navy job, you're making these ships, you can take home wood and use it as you see fit. And <laughs> Lord Sandwich noticed over the years that these pieces of wood were getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and like much bigger. At the end of the day, these people carrying these big pieces of wood on their shoulders out. So he said, that's it. No, no more. He discovered the entire houses had been built with these chips. That's it. You can't have any more chips of wood. They went on strike, and it's from this that we have the expression, a chip on his shoulder, meaning someone who resents authority because they weren't taking the chips. They, the pieces of wood were called chips. They were supposed to be small little chips of paper. And because they didn't resent it, it was the beginning of the end. He was brought down. He had to quit because he didn't reform the Navy. It was another 20 years before they actually reformed that. But he did. He was very enlightened. He, he, in 1778, he paid for Captain Cook's round the world voyage. And as a thank you, Cook named the Sandwich Islands after him, which of course we call Hawaii. And this shows you, I think, the enlightened nature of Lord Sandwich, who's gotten a bad reputation over the years. Um, this is his great, 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 great grandson, the current Earl of Sandwich there on the left with his son Orlando in 2004, opening the very first Earl of Sandwich shop in America. They started, the son, Orlando, is the one who actually made this happen and come to life. He started lobbing his father and saying, hey, dad, we've got this name. They don't have a lot of money. We should do something to capitalize on this. And they started doing local organic things in England and then expanding it further and further out. They had the big first launch here at Walt Disney World, of course, where else? And they used to have a shop in um, Terminal E at Logan, which was the international. And this was my big treat to myself, was when I would go to fly to the UK, I'd stop here at the Earl Salmon shop, and I would get this, which is called the original. This is the original in 1762 that the Earl insisted he be fed, which is roasted beef, sharp cheddar, and horseradish sauce. And the key, I think, was they made the bread right here at the airport at Logan. It just melted in your mouth. Oh my God, it was so good. And it's, it's gone. There's still one shop in Boston Common, um, and they are still, well, they're all over the world. And the guy who started Planet Hollywood is the one who's behind all of this. <laughs> this is the Earl's house in, in Dorset, Mapperton House. Um, very nice, not huge. Um, some, of, some of the bigger Earl of Sandwich Shops reproduced the interiors of his house in the Sandwich Shop, so I think it's pretty cool. Now, this, this is, believe it or not, this is pronounced Annick Castle. Ignore that L because this is actually England we're talking about and they bastardized their own language. Um, so this is a really imposing castle. So look at these stats here. The second largest inhabited castle in England after Windsor and the Percy family who owns it to this day has been here since 1309. And I just love that. My family's only been here since 1309. This is on, on the border, almost on the border with Scotland and that's why it's so imposing looking because up until the 19th century, there were um, constant battles, why would I say battles? Stealing each other's wives and, and cattle um, between the Scots and the English. And so this was very much a fortress and it belies what's inside. But before we get to what's inside, this is a 1930s drawing 
and this is actually the matte painting for it. Uh, this castle is believed to be the inspiration for the Wicked Witch's Castle in The Wizard of Oz. And, bringing up the modern days, almost every one of the Harry Potter movies was filmed here. So this is from the very first Harry Potter movie when they're learning how to fly. And this, 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 is, this is why it's so perfect, because it's so scary and spooky looking, which is why it's so surprising when you go inside and you see these, these interiors that are done in the style of a 16th century Roman palazzo. These are done in the 1850s. So you have this very scary looking exterior and these very sophisticated interiors. This is the anti-library. So there are three Titians, just this little teeny tiny room. Um, and the art collection, owned by the Duke of Northumberland, I didn't tell you that, um, still owned by him today. This is the library. Um, he has four full-time librarians, as, as one does. Um, and this is the saloon. These are all these interiors that are done up in the 19th century. And if you go around England, they'll tell you this is very typical of, of the ducal residence, very grand. The same thing can be said here for the state dining room. And that up there is the first duke and duchess over the fireplace. Um, and they're the ones who made this the grand space that it is. This is the current Duke and Duchess, just to give you a different contrast in how things have changed. Um, very, very, very much a working couple. Um, the first Duke, like most of us, was human. And um, he had foibles. In this case, as they would say in the UK, a, a child on the wrong side of the blanket. Um, so he had a bastard child who um, was named James Smithson after. Um, originally his mother's family and then he found out that his father's name had been Smithson and he changed it. He was very successful and he left when he died the equivalent of about $300 million to the United States in 1829 and nobody to this day knows why he did it. He didn't know anybody in America that we know of. He never been to the United States and the only reason that makes any sense is that he as a scientist, he was primarily a biologist and a chemist, um, recognized America as a place where you could actually achieve based on merit rather than birth. And because he had been prejudiced against because he was a bastard, um, he liked the idea of this enlightened idea of people being recognized for who they are. And of course, in his will, it said it should be called the United States National Museum. And believe it or not, it was called that officially until the 1960s, when it of course officially became the Smithsonian, named after him. And um, it is still the world's largest museum complex. 19 museums, nine research centers, 21 libraries, and the National Zoo. I mean, there's nothing else like this in the world as far as just a power of museums coming together with one government supporting them. So if you have a house like that in, in Northumberland, you have to have a London house as well. And the Dukes of Northumberland actually had a London townhouse, which has been demolished, Northumberland house, and they had this, this villa, they called it, outside of London. Zion Abbey was how it started off. And what's interesting about this is that this is, this is the center of London way over here. This is the Thames, this little teeny tiny thing here that they call a river. And um, what's interesting is that this was way out of the country. And of course now it's part of, of greater <laughs> metropolitan London. The story of this is once again the story of Henry VIII because this was one of the last great abbeys founded before the Reformation. It was named in memory of the Swedish mystic Saint Bridget, who was one of the patron saints of Europe. It was named after, of course, Mount Zion and the Holy Land. And it was hugely successful until, of course, Henry comes along. And Henry um, says, I want this all go away. But before that, the Henry that founded it, Henry V, founded it so that 60 nuns and 20 priests could pray in eternity to save the soul of his father, Henry IV, for his role in the murder of Richard II, because Henry here wouldn't have been king if he hadn't murdered him. So that sort of follows. Um, so guilt from, from his son here is like, we have to make this great abbey. Henry VIII comes along and says, no, we're gonna sell this baby off. We're Protestant now. Um, Henry, of course, dies um, a year after it sold as a, as a private house, it sold into the Smithson family, to the Dukes of Northumberland. So 1546, it becomes Zion House, no longer Zion Abbey. And in 1547, Henry dies, and his casket stops here overnight on the way to Windsor Castle for burial. Um, it's important to remember that Henry weighed about 400 pounds when he died. He was unable to take stairs. They pulled him up with a series of contraptions and pulleys up and down stairs. Um, so he was a large man, 
His coffin was left in the Great Hall overnight. During the night, the body expanded and broke through the coffin, and the various bodily juices were dripping on the floor, and the dogs were found licking them up the next morning. And this was considered divine retribution to Henry for his desecration of the Abbey, because Henry was a real piece of work. He was a nasty piece of shit. So um, he, they still, to this day, they believe this, this was God saying, look, your body, your body's down. So after that, Lady Jane Grey, everyone should know Lady Jane, she is the famous queen for nine days. This is so after Henry's um, son dies, Edward VI, he's a Protestant. His stepsister is Mary I, who's very, very Catholic, another bad person. And in an attempt to stop Mary the Catholic coming to the throne, people, mainly her father in law, whoops, her father in law here, the Duke of Northumberland, who of course owns Zion House, contracted to get. Lady Jane, of course, is Protestant to become the queen against her, her own wishes. And she accepts the crown at Zion House in 1553. I, I love this picture of her father-in-law because he looks like what he is, which is evil. Um, <laughs> just conniving, power hungry. He, of course, was executed after Mary came to the throne. And of course, so is, so is Lady Jane. Um, and Mary, Queen Mary, did not want to execute um, Lady Jane. But she was too much of a cost to live. She was only 18, I believe. Um, she was too much of a focus of resistance, and Mary had this thing about Protestantism. By the way, I should say, most historians believe that if Mary had lived, Mary only reigned for five years. If Mary had lived longer, England would be a Catholic country today, because she would have converted it back completely. So this is the rather unimpressive entrance to Zion House today. It's pronounced, even though it's spelled with an S, it's pronounced with a Z sound. So you think, ugh, big deal, it looks, it's not that impressive looking. Um, but you see what I have up here from the wonderful architecture historian, Mark Girard, Robert Adams' most brilliant sequence of rooms. So in the 1760s, the first Duke, the one who had the illegitimate son, who gave us the Smithsonian, hired Robert Adams, in many people's opinions, including mine, the finest architect ever to come out of Britain, to redo the rooms. So this is the entrance hall. And what's amazing to me about this space, which is just astonishing to walk into, is that an ancient Roman would feel completely at home here. And what's even cooler is that we know that Julius Caesar, when he invaded Britain, crossed the Thames right about where Zion House is today. So Julius Caesar could walk in here and without any exaggeration feel like he walked into a contemporary space. This is so Roman in its authenticity, what Robert Adam paid attention to is just astonishing. You go from there into what's called the ante room, which is, I think, possibly the most luscious small room in England. And um, the architect historian Eileen Harris says this is the first example in Britain of having freestanding columns with figures on top of it inside of a British house, a British building of any kind, actually. The other thing that's interesting, these are actually green marble columns. It's hard to tell in this photograph. And um, they were dredged from the Tiber in Rome. And they're thought to be first century. And they were brought back here to incorporate. And they didn't have enough, so Robert Adam commissioned copies to made to fill up the empty spaces. So this, to me, is what everyone should go ooh and ah when they think of England. This is West Wickham Park in Buckinghamshire, also owned by the National Trust. It's not the house you should go ooh and ah over, although that's definitely worth going ooh and ah over. It's this. It's just this, this landscape, which you get a sense of here in Vermont. Um, but it's this, these gentle hills. It's just, oh, it's just magical. And this house um, is considered the most Italianate facade of any house in Britain. Designed um, on the inspiration of Palladio, this is the only house that has a double colonnade running around. This is so very Italian. And you can see here in this next scene, every facade is a different form of a temple. So here in the east facade, this is a temple that's made to take you back to ancient Rome. What's interesting about this house, I'm sure many of you have seen it many times on PBS programs and in movies and not realized it because it's very popular for movie makers to use when they want to film a scene in Italy. But they don't want to pay to go to Italy and film it, so you come here because it's so Italian. And to give you a sense of the continuity of the design, so this is what we just saw the east facade, West Wickham, and here is Maryworth Castle in Kent, a house that still survives, which was owned by the man who, this uncle, his nephew built this house. We think very much that he based this um, colonnade here, this portico, on Maryworth Castle. And Maryworth was based on the Villa Rotunda. 
in Vicenza, and this is considered one of the most important buildings ever erected, um, sort of a pilgrimage for people like me. But you can definitely see this, this, this sort of coming together um, of these styles. And this is very important, I think, about one of the things I'm fond of saying all the time, which is that everyone goes on the shoulders of those who came before them. I mean, very few of us can have original ideas. So um, like most of these great houses, you would have had in the park what were called folly. So let's step back and redefine that. So you have the house. Immediately around the house, you have the gardens. Outside of the gardens, you have what's called the park, which is a landscaped area meant to look like it's natural. No flowers, just lots of landscape. And then outside of the park, you have the larger estate. The estate is where the farmland was. This is in the park. And you would dot it with follies that were showing to your visitors how well educated you were. And in this case, the Temple of the Winds was modeled on the second century BC Tower of the Winds in Athens. And this is the very first example in England to reproduce a monument from Greek antiquity in 1759. And it doesn't end there because you can see the Temple of Apollo here that was built in 1761 at West Wickham. And what this is modeled on, of course, is the Arch of Constantine in Rome from 315 AD. And this is very common with the, the English aristocrats building to show that, that they were educated. And this was for a very select audience. So only other aristocrats who had also gone on the grand tour who were equally educated would see these things because they're the only ones who would actually know what they were seeing and be impressed. So this is Sir Francis Ashford. He's the man who built the house. He um, <laughs> is an interesting character. He founded a group called the Hellfire Club in the 18th century. Now, I can't go into all the details because they're really juicy, but I give you a summary here. Um, they met twice a year and were infamous for devoting their time to getting drunk and whoring. Its members came from the top of society and included an Oxford professor and a government minister. So what they would do is they would bring prostitutes from London down, dress them up as nuns. They would dress up as, as bishops and the pope, and I'll leave your imagination right there as what they would do together. Um, he was rapidly anti-Catholic. And just he actually, once in Holy Week in Rome, he snuck in um, to, to the Vatican when the, the priests were flagellating themselves, you know, whipping themselves in the back. And he came in dressed all in black with his own whip. And he would whip the priests in the black. And, and they would, the cries would go up, the devil is among us. And they really thought it was the devil. And of course, it was just him. And he was a devil. But what's cool about this is um, this is the government minister who was a member of the Hellfire Club, our friend, the fourth, fourth Earl Sandwich. And he was an honorary member, Benjamin Franklin. Um, anybody who knows about Franklin knows he was a libertine, and this would not be surprising at all. He lived with Sir Francis for four years before the unpleasantness of the American Revolution came along. And actually, in, it's amazing enough, in 1773, he and Sir Francis together rewrote the Book of Common Prayer. And we actually have, have here a copy, sort of ironic considering what they did. Um, writing to his son in 1773, Ben says, I am in this house as much at ease as if it were my own. And the gardens are Paris. The gardens were amazing. The gardens actually, <laughs> God, the gardens were designed from the air in a balloon to look like the female genitalia, um, just to go really off the end. Um, but a pleasanter thing is the kind countenance and very intelligent conversation of mine host who, having seen all parts of Europe and kept the best company in the world, is himself the best existing. Um, they didn't talk after the revolution, but um, you know, they were friends <laughs> until then. This is a house, the only one I'm going to talk about that doesn't exist anymore. This is the Deep Dean in Surrey, which was demolished in 1969 um, and replaced with um, an office tower. What's interesting about this is the man who created it, which is this man, Sir Thomas Hope, seen here in Turkish dress. And he did this incredible, he designed this house. The interior was, the exterior was still there. He designed all the rooms himself. So the entrance hall you walked into was just this, this astonishing space of classical proportions, incredible collections. The reason we're here, and the reason he's famous is because of this book he wrote in 1807 called Household Furniture and Interior Decoration. And with this, for the very first time, the phrase interior decoration entered the English lexicon. And in this book, he told you how your house should look. Now, he, he designed houses, he designed furniture, he designed almost everything. He came from a very wealthy banking family, um, Hope and Company, which interestingly enough, 
had financed um, the Louisiana Purchase when the United States was trying to buy Louisiana. They couldn't get a loan because it wasn't really a very recognized government. And Hope and Company in Amsterdam gave them the loan that enabled Thomas Jefferson to buy Louisiana. That's where the money came from. They were Scottish, they immigrated to the Netherlands in the 17th century. They came back in the early 19th century to get away from Napoleon. And all that money came to roost in London. And you have Thomas Hope here telling you how your house should look and then giving you drawings that he did himself of his house. And this is the picture gallery of his house in London. Um, this is the very first example in British architecture of having a Greek Doric column in an English house. Sadly, this is also demolished. Um, here at Buskett Park in Oxfordshire, another house owned by the National Trust, which doesn't look that impressive from the outside. Amazing collections. You walk in the front door and you see this. So this is classic Thomas Hope furniture. This is some of the most expensive furniture in the world because so little of it was made because it was so expensive to have made. And what's amazing about these pieces is that they are illustrated. These very pieces are illustrated in his book. This, these are in his drawing room. The settee and these chairs are right here. And this book, amazingly enough, has never gone out of print. You can still buy it today for like $5. <coughs> This is in Boston. This is a bed attributed to Thomas Hope. And this gives you the best example I can show you in a modern sense of what his style was. And his style was really undefinable. He merged Greek and Roman and Egyptian and Regency, and they were completely impractical. I mean, nobody wants to sleep in a bed like this. Um, and he believed that everyone should be buying this kind of stuff. And of course, not realizing that only 1% of the population could afford to buy this. This is um, a chandelier he designed. This is at the Met today. The other one we just saw was at the MFA. Um, he loved Griffins. Matter of fact, there was a gallery at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, um, an English Regency gallery, that has nothing but pieces um, designed by Hope. Incredible space. So the real reason we're here is not because of Louis XV, although he's part of the story. It's because of his Order of the Golden Fleece. Before the Order of the Garter, which is now considered the most prestigious chivalric order in the world, the Order of the Golden Fleece, which was given out by the, the King of France or the Austro-Hungarian Emperor, were considered the most important orders in the world. And Louis here had his remade. It was lost during the French Revolution. It was broken down and stolen. And these are all, so this is obviously the Golden Fleece. This is where Brooks Brothers got their idea from. Um, and what's important about this is that thing right there. That was called the French Blue. It was bought by Louis XIV, his predecessor, and Louis loved to wear big gems. He wore it on his lapel, and Louis XV had it incorporated into this new order of the Golden Fleece. After the French Revolution, as I said, everything went, went sideways, and it disappeared. It disappeared for about 30 years, and it turned up in London, and it was bought by this man, Henry Philip Hope, who was Thomas Hope's brother. And Henry Philip Hope was one of the most important collectors in the world of gems, and it's because of him that that stone that's been recut is today called the Hope Diamond, the most famous diamond in the world, named after this family. And just to give you a background of the Hope, it is rather astonishing. It's 45 carats, it's over 1 billion years old, and it's the largest deep blue diamond in the world. So I love the story of how it came to the United States in an official capacity. It was sold over the years, um, but in, 19, in 1950, it was bought by the famous Harry Winston, and he toured it around the United States. And he said in interviews later that he was embarrassed that the United States did not have a national collection of gems. So he called the Smithsonian up and said, hey, I'll jumpstart you by giving you this if you can get other people to donate other gems. And that's what happened, and that's why we have a national collection of gems at the Smithsonian. But the cooler thing was, um, when it, became, it came in 1958, and he sent it by registered mail. And the cool thing about this, this is the actual package they went to the Smithsonian. I love all, the, all these postage media things all around. There was lots of speculation in the press. How will this diamond get from New York to Washington? Will there be you know, men with handcuffs and briefcases on the train, on the planes? And Harry Winston said, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to put it in a brown paper box and send it. And he did, and this is considered the most valuable gemstone in the world, probably worth up to $100 million today. So this is the last house we're going to visit, um, built by the first Duke of Montague, who you see here, in a 17th century portrait. It's important to remember what he liked, which was everything French. He was four times named British ambassador to the court of Louis XIV. 
And he built a house that is today called the English Versailles. And you get a feeling for that when you look at it here from the air. Um, it's Bowden House in Northamptonshire, still owned by his descendants today. Um, and this is also something that's, I think, uniquely English, which it's a calendar house. So it has seven courtyards, 12 entrances, 52 chimneys, and 365 windows. And you see this a lot with the big houses. Everything's divided by a part of the calendar. Um, these are the most French stables I've ever seen in England. It, they're, they're just astonishing. There's actually a, a, a tea room there today, as, as you find in stables these days in England. Um, you go inside and you find some of the most important tapestries and rugs in existence. And the reason for that is it's owned today by the Duke of Buccleuch, who was a Scottish peer. This was their English house. And for over 100 years, from the mid-19th century to the um, early 20th century, actually it's the 1920s, they didn't visit once, but the house was fully staffed with about 60 servants. And all the shutters were closed for 100 years. So you have tapestries like this. This is an unusual tapestry. It's an English tapestry made by John Vanderbank um, that give us the first hint of why people went ecstatic over these things. Because when you read today the letters from the 17th century particularly, people are going just orgasmic about these things. You're like, I don't get it. It's mainly brown. And that's, of course, because they've faded so much. We don't understand the colors they once had. This has faded as well. But this is a, a clue, a beginning to understand how incredibly important these were. These were the most expensive things you would have in your house by far. And they weren't just decorative, of course. They also helped to keep drafts out. This is probably the most important collection in Britain of French furniture, not surprisingly, considering who built it. And you see here um, the famous um, Henri Charles Gould. This is one of the most important pieces of French furniture in Britain. And this is made by Pierre Gull. Gull was actually, before Bull Bull, is very famous for putting in um, pieces of dyed tortoiseshell and laying it with brass and sometimes pewter to create this very fancy design. Th these desks, uh, these are completely impractical. You cannot even get your knees underneath these. Even a small person can't. They were meant to be decorative. And um, that's very clear uh, when you realize that this was actually made for Louis XIV and he gave it to the first Duke of Montague as an ambassadorial gift and it all came back here to Bowton. There's also one of the most important collections of Sèvres in private hands at Bowton, and this is some of the rarest Sèvres ever made. These potpourri vases made in 1759. What is important about these is that they've been meant to be 24, 7, 100, 365 days a year potpourri. So you would, in spring and summer, you would actually grow. You have, you have some water down here and you have bulbs. These little fish, these little dolphins would pop out and these flowers would pop out and you would put in plants and you would grow fresh ones in the, in the winter and in the fall you would put these porcelain flowers in place the real ones and then you would put <laughs> potpourri into the, that lattice work up there to give you the smell of fresh flowers these were actually made from Madame de Pompadour and the Dukes de Clou were so rich for so long these were bought as so many things were after the, the French Revolution when French aristocrats were desperate for money and they were selling things on the cheap these, these were bought by a 19th century Duke of Buccleuch with about 300 other pieces of sev, and then they were put in the attics and the stables of Alton House, and they weren't discovered until the 1950s. And they literally unpacked these things and said, what the hell is this? It is just, it's just astonishing. I mean, this is not Bill Gates money. You know, this, this is not you know, horrible people like um, Tesla money. These are people with culture. These are people that actually they don't, he's, he's rich, the Duke of Buccleuch, but he's not a billionaire. But he has hundreds of years of collecting behind him. And there's just nothing to compare to that in the United States. So this relatively unimpressive drawing room about him, um, you think, eh. it has 40 Van Dykes on the walls. <laughs> Small Van Dykes, but still 40 um, Van Dyke oil sketches. And my, my favorite part about this is, we're in here with um, the Countess of Southampton. The Earl and Countess of Southampton were ancestors of the current Duke of Buccleuch. And this is a very interesting um, painting of the Countess in 1600. So what's unusual about this for historians is that she has not dressed yet. I know it seems hard to us to believe. Um, she's in the process of getting dressed. She's in, she's in a state of undress. It's important to remember that sleeves were an add-on 
for men and women, they were actually pinned into you. They, they weren't part of the bodice of a shirt, or in this case, a dress. And so what you see behind her here on the left is a pin cushion with straight pins in it. And to get dressed for court, which is what we think she's getting dressed for, took an enormous amount of maids a long time to pin you in all the various pieces. This is astonishing. Buttons had been invented, but as decorative elements, there were no button holes yet. I, I know, it's shocking. Um, so you had to be pinned at everything you pinned on. It took so long to do for your maids that when they were done, as a special thank you, you would give them a few coins as pin money. And that's where this, this phrase, pin money, comes from, the small amount of money as a thank you. This is her husband, the third Earl of Southampton, who was quite the lad. Um, he was part of the famous rebellion against Elizabeth I, Essex Rebellion. He was commuted, uh, he was sent to prison, was be beheaded. He was eventually released. He spent two years in Tower of London. And when he got released, he wanted his portrait painted. This is the painting he had done. And <laughs> His wife said, I want to be in the portrait. He said, nope. Trixie is going to be in the portrait. <laughs> because Trixie came from their London townhouse on her own, supposedly, and went down all the chimneys of the Tower of London until she found his cell. And she stayed with him the entire time. His wife, on the other hand, almost never came to visit him. So Trixie here is, is the star of this. And look at her. Oh my god. She's like, you can just tell she's a loyal. I, tuxedo kitties are always the best, and she's clearly a tuxedo. I will end actually speaking of kitties with my own. Um, this, is, this is Miles, um, who thinks he's a bit of a king himself, um, and who was very sad about this today. He, this is a breed called a ragamuffin, and they're bred for their dog-like tendencies. And he could tell if I had a suitcase, and I was like, you're leaving me. Um, so that is it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. So I, I think if anybody has any questions, I'm certainly happy to try to answer any for you. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, hold on, there's a microphone coming. Everybody has to hear your question. In the opening slide, where there are two matching Apollo Belvedere's looking at each other, yes. and a niche, yeah. what is under the niche? What's under the niche? It will, they look like cellarettes, but we're going with the Well, that, that's, I have to look at that's Kettleston Hall in Derbyshire, and that's another Robert Adam design. And I think they're not cellarettes, I think they're actually benches. Let's see here. Do you mean these, yeah. these things here? Right here? Those, those are benches designed by Robert Adam. I think there are 12 of them all around the room, um, and they're modeled on the tomb of Agrippa in Rome. Everything Robert Adam did was about Rome. Uh, yeah, I, I was curious, how, how did they get the labor to, to do this type of work? Was it, did they import it? Was it Italian? I mean, you mentioned um, the one piece that was- Most of all the, so, so the nature of a country house is that you have everything in your little community that's self-sustaining. Even today at Chatsworth, when I think one of the great houses of Britain, there are estate carpenters, there are estate plumbers, classers, everything is done in staff. The only thing that would have been imported would have been for frescoes. You would have Italians and French, so Antonio Riario, Louis Laguerre will come over, and Italians for, this, for the stucco work, the stucadori, um, because they were just the best. But in, for instance, in this case, at Kettleston Hall, these, um, these columns, which are called the Marble Hall, these are actually alabaster, and they were mined on the family's own um, estate. This is English alabaster, with beautiful sort of a cherry, cherry color. So this would have all been done by, um, by the family. The only thing that would have been, the stucco up here was actually done by an English man um, called Rose, and he was a favorite of Robert Adam, and he had been taught by the Italians. Because the Italians, I mean, at the end of the day, everything comes back to Rome. Everything starts at Rome, as far as I'm concerned. Thank you. Did that answer your question? Um, while we're waiting, I can tell you one of my favorite stories about, remember I mentioned to you about the, um, <laughs> the book about um, the houses, the country house at war. The best story in that book was about a man who stayed in his country house. This is unusual. Usually they went somewhere else when they were occupied by troops. His was occupied by American troops. And the big question always was, what do you do with the art? Do you take it with you? A lot of people took it and put it in storage in London, which was a really stupid idea because they usually got bombed in smithereens. 
So this guy said, I'm going to leave the art on the walls, just like this, and put studs in and put plywood over all of it. And um, was really happy when he got the house back in 1947, but nothing was touched. And he pulled the plywood off. These are all ancestral portraits. Every single one of them had the eyeballs cut out, just the eyeballs. Fast forward 50 years, his son gets an, um, a postmark envelope from New York with all the eyeballs in it. This, this is the American army that was stationed here doing the war, and nobody knows. Like, was the guy his deathbed confessing what he did? Did you know someone discover after he died what he did? Who knows? But th these houses, this, this is uh, this is one of my favorite stories. I'm sorry for interrupting you, sir, with your question. Oh no, that's fascinating. Excuse me. Um, do you know how many of these houses, uh, like Clifton or Stone East, are now hotels in the United Kingdom? I don't know how many, the, um, that's a good question. Clifton, of course, is owned by the National Trust. It's just, it's just let to a hotel company. Um, I don't know, that's a very good question. Not as many as you would think. The thing to remember here is that the National Trust owns about 400 houses. We think, because nobody knows, we think there are about 5,000 of these houses in Britain. The vast majority are completely private and are never open and don't, aren't even really known to the general public or even people live in the area because they're kept by the original families or they've changed hands um, very frequent, very infrequently and everything's been kept very secret. So um, we don't know. I mean, we simply don't know. I would say certainly easily 100 of these houses, easily. The problem is um, they don't convert well to, to hotels and, and generally what happens is houses like this were saved. I should say this um, in, after the war, after World War II, what saved these houses for complete demolition were hotels, were hospitals, um, sanatoriums, um, schools that bought these houses no one wanted to live in. And of course, once these became more valuable starting in the 1980s, particularly in the 90s, these institutions that own these houses are like, let's get the crap out of Dodge. We can get a lot of money for this and build a building that really works for us, which is not this. And then these houses were mostly, we converted back to single family residences with mostly dot com money. So um, houses are actually migrating away from hotel use now, they're going back. Uh, I use the example of the Back Bay in Boston. When I moved to Boston in 1990. I think there were only seven or eight houses in all the Back Bay that were still single family. The rest of them had been converted into institutional use or to condos or flats. And now there are over 30 that are, are single family. So you're seeing this reappreciation. This is what Evelyn Wall thought would never happen, that people are coming back to live in these big houses again and live in them as single family houses. Um, because th with a few exceptions, they really aren't very practical. So Cliveden is a perfect example. Cliveden is so big, it actually works quite well as a hotel. But most of them, it, it's, you know, there are no elevators. You know, it's just very hard to make them work as modern health. They don't have health and safety. Um, that's a big issue as well with the, with the British government. Is anyone else have a question? Wait, wait till the microphone comes, sir. It's coming right this way. Yes, thank you. Having grown up in England, I've visited many of these houses over the years. I'm sure not as many as you have. Uh, they are amazing places, but the legacy that you alluded to at the beginning is still somewhat controversial. Uh, people have very mixed feelings about these houses. Uh, oh gosh, yes. My own part, I, you know, my family was in service a couple of generations back. When I walked through these houses, the last stop on the tour is usually down in the kitchen. Yeah. And you get a little sense of how hard it was. It was horrible life. It, it wasn't just a horrible life for the servants. You know, the National Trust has started this. I think about 30% of these 5,000 houses that live today were built on slave money. So that's something else to remember as well. So the thing about slavery in Britain is like it is here in New England is like that's something other people did. You know, that's the South. They had slaves, not us in New England. And that's true, there was no slavery in Britain, at least not in the 18th century, but they owned slaves in the Indies and all over. So that a lot of these houses were built on slave money and plantations that the money flowed to Britain from other parts of the empire. And of course, this has been hugely controversial because the National Trust, God bless them, is making this a very part of the story now. And there's been a big pushback, particularly from the nasty Tory government, who says, we're not giving you any more money because you're not telling the story we want to hear. And the story is, people do not want to come these beautiful houses and hear about something unpleasant like slavery. It's like, well, that's just too bad because that's part of the story and you're going to fucking hear it. <laughs> Sorry? People pay their subscriptions to the National Trust and have been going out on Saturdays and Sundays to visit these houses are very upset about this as well because they feel the National Trust has been taken over by some very woke people. 
who want to rewild the gardens and want to make these houses all about the history of slavery and oppression. I don't think it's all about, I don't think it's fair to say it's all about houses. I think it's part of the story. And the part of the story that's been you know, suppressed for hundreds of years is now coming out. And that's not the story, it's just an element of the story. And it should be with every other part of the element, the part of a full picture, because that's what history is. We're not gonna be able to silence things because we don't like them, although people like Trump love to try. Um, so any other questions? Yes, ma'am. I, I can just say it. So because you're so knowledgeable and an expert in this field, do you have kind of an in with some of these? Are there houses you still want to see that you haven't been oh, able yes. to? Oh, yes. I'll put some white houses. Get more, through, yeah. more houses you want to see. Um, I've been very lucky because I've been doing this for 30 years, the research. So over the years, um, I've gotten to know owners because I've come over researching your houses and taking photographs and such. And, um, so that's been very helpful to start doing these tours. And the reason that I started doing tours about 15 years ago now is because lectures like this, I've been doing lectures like this for almost 20 years, and people come up to me after lecture and say, I want to go in your tours. And I would say, well, I don't do tours. <laughs> and this happened for about a year. I said, maybe I should do tours. Um, and what I realized was these people I had met, the owners through research, would give me entree to, um, that would normally not be open to Private, and, and this is an issue because there's a lot of thievery. And, you know, the big country house, um, it's a huge problem in Britain. Um, they don't have physical violence like what we do in the United States, but they have much more property violence. So these country houses are being robbed a lot. Of course, the nature of them being in the country is that you can have as many alarms as you want. It doesn't make any difference because by the time the police get there, they're long gone. So um, there, there, there's, there's this a, a huge issue about, it, it, you know, the, the worst thing right now is they actually steal the lead off the roofs. They come in the night with blow torches, and the lead is laid in long sheets, and they come with blow torches, and they cut the seams, and they roll it up. And you get up in the morning, and you don't have a roof. And the reason, of course, you use lead in most of these houses is because lead lasts for about 150 years. It's a perfect roofing material. It doesn't rust. It doesn't rot very easily. I'm sorry, I got way off. What was I saying before this? Uh, somebody, somebody help, me, help, me, help me out here. <laughs> Oh, the tour is, yes, yeah, so, so this, thank you very much. So this, this actually helped me get into, one of the things that I, people love in the tourism more than anything else is the ability to get into houses. Of course, we all want this, that aren't open to the public. And particularly to have dinner with Lord and Lady and so-and-so, or um, lunch with, you know, their graces or whatever. And basically, <laughs> it comes down to money. If you pay enough money, and you know the people, you can go almost anywhere. Um, because even the really wealthy country house owners, um, it takes a lot of money to run these estates. People always tell me they wish they could live in the world of doubt and I said, you do not want that. Those houses are a ball and chain to inherit because they never, ever stop requiring money. As a matter of fact, it's estimated that Hyker Castle, where Doubt and was filmed, has $20 million in essential backlogs and repairs that they can't even afford to do. There are like 50 rooms at Hyker Castle that are just shut because there's so much mold damage, they just shut them and don't go in there anymore. But you know, pretend that room doesn't exist anymore because they can't afford to maintain them. These houses are, are hugely important to the national psyche and to the history. And as we continue to unravel what history really is, we come across more of these things. But the thing to remember, if you're one of these owners, this actually happened in Highclere Castle. They had a folly, a temple of Diana that was falling down. Mm -hmm. And because it's a listed building, I mentioned before about listed buildings in Britain, um, the government examines them and says to the owner, to the the Earl, um, in this case, Earl Carnarvon. Lord Carnarvon, your, um, your father needs a million pounds in repairs. And he said, I don't have it. And they said, okay. It's a grade one, which is the highest listed building. Grade one building has to be preserved. So the government spends a million pounds and then gives him the bill and takes him to court and make sure he pays it. And that's what happens if you have listed buildings that you own and you can't afford to maintain. You can be bankrupted. So I say to people, do not, do not wish for this. Do not wish to leave these things. As much as I love these houses, my ideal is to live in a little cottage with a little stream in the backyard. I would oh. never want a big house. Um, I love the history, I love the story, I love walking into them. They are walking, living bits of history, um, but they are incredibly expensive to maintain, and I wouldn't wish that on anybody um, unless they were a billionaire. Any other questions? We have one over here. <laughs> Thank you very much for that little burst of applause. Just quickly, are you an architect? No, I, I'm not. I'm what's called an architectural historian, so I study the history of the house. I'm not an architect. I could never pass the math in a million years. <laughs> never, never, ever. Um, thank you all very much for coming. This has been delightful.